you may see I put here not the history of Soviet information warfare, but the story of Soviet information warfare. Because uh, from my perspective, uh, things uh, that uh, Putin is probably doing with this concept uh, uh, are the similar things that he is doing with the concept of war. A kind of a non-linear approach towards influence operations. Not, not specifically borrowing historical everything from Soviet times, but mixing it uh, in a very postmodern way and, and uh, putting forward some old concepts with the new technologies and, and, and so on and, and so forth. Uh, therefore, I would say it is impossible probably to uh, <coughs> interpret those issues from the extremes. One extreme uh, from my perspective was when uh, we tried, we in Western maybe academia, tried to interpret uh, Kremlin strategies from Western concepts approach. And there was a period where everyone was trying to find the soft power of Kremlin. The articles, the books, uh, the Russian world as a soft power, and, and, and so on. And now there's another kind of extreme in this. Uh, now, uh, and we heard maybe in some quotes here as well that, you know, it's, it's not media or communication strategies at all. It's something weaponized of a war, warfare uh, concept and so on. So in both cases, I, I would name those kind of extreme cases. I, I would try to find the golden middle maybe here. So uh, I would like to start uh, with, uh, after lunch, we need to, to have a kind of a, uh, our, our brain uh, running again. And uh, I'm not telling jokes, but I, I will show you pictures. Uh, pictures which I think help us interpret a bit what Putin is really doing with our hearts and minds. Uh, those pictures, uh, the question is, does the picture ring a bell in the audience? Do you know what is, what, what's the picture here? Uh, because in Lithuania, probably even the school children would know it because it is uh, a fresco in Strasbourg, one of the first historical artistic representations of Lithuania. And this is a, a first uh, 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 artistic interpretation of soft power project in w one sense. It is a march of nations towards the soft power project of that time, Christianity. So those are the, the, the nations uh, approaching uh, Christianity. I have uh, uh, some ex expert excerpts uh, from here. Uh, th those are just screenshots nowadays, very popular word. Uh, from, you know, internet screenshot, but it's a screenshot from the fresco. Those are the last nations on the march. And I put here the question of the self-esteem question. The, the, the difficulty of the whole project of the time, as vice versa, the, the question of difficulty of European project now. The question of how it is difficult to go forward and to be the last ones. Lithuania on the marches here, the last ones. You can see. To, to, add, to add on top of this, I, I want, to, I want to, to, to show you that some of the nations are having an easy ride on the horses, and, and some has to, to do a, a tough work. But the, probably my, my play, visual play here is with this last with this last slide and this other sc screenshot, that we have a kind of a, this last one looking back, having nostalgias and then and, and so on, that this is so difficult, so uh, it hits your self-esteem. It's a kind of distraction issue. And in this way, I really want to approach now uh, the, the question of, uh, uh, maybe Russian or nowadays Putin's uh, strategy as a way of kind of a strategic distraction uh, towards uh, Western or European soft power. A way how you can, you know, make strategic, you know, pictures, narratives and problems on, on this difficult, difficult march. And this distraction issue, 
and in many ways, uh, for me, rings a bell of uh, Soviet, uh, specifically military strategies, or Soviet, uh, you know, mix of maskerovka, reflexive control, and many other cases, because this is the best tool you have in the toolbox to do this. It's, an, it's not an a, a alternative soft power, so you don't play with the Western concepts, and suddenly you, you reinvent the concepts that you had at, at hand at the time. My uh, 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 next slide, uh, when I knew that uh, we, will we will be on the panel with Ed Lucas, so, uh, but that's not just because of that. Uh, it's now quite popular and quite uh, 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 common knowledge to interpret those historical concepts and to to approach uh, this from this historical perspective uh, and, is, and to add this military experience and, and military concepts, history or story towards it as well. I think that the best really uh, books that deal with that are here, but my provocation uh, here with the slide is that, well, on the other hand, you could have another two pictures uh, on the slide and have as well uh, a kind of explanate that have a kind of a explanatory power to it. Those are, you know, just from uh, internet. That the question how you play with illusions and how you play with the tricks uh, on those uh, populations to distract them and to do this. In in essence, I say I would say that this is kind of a, a genius of contemporary Putin's uh, strategy to to borrow not just. Uh, uh, Soviet history of, of many concepts, not to bring in front uh, the military uh, uh, aspect of those co concepts, but you actually do a kind of a postmodern political uh, tricksters uh, stuff in, in, in this public arena. And uh, just to, to back my argument here, I would like to read out uh, uh, a quote here uh, from um, uh, a military expert's article, the, the, uh, the guy is John Davis, the, the article is called uh, Deception as Magic. And it was written in Military Review, actually. And the, the quote goes as follows. The principles of magic, which all of us, especially children, like and enjoy, include the following. Disappearance, appearance, Transposition of objects, physical change in an object, apparent defiance of natural law, invisible sources of motion, mental phenomena, these principles also govern the principles of nowadays deception. Uh, the, the idea is actually that, that you, you, you do a postmodern approach towards those uh, uh, military deception concepts to, to a strategic level probably. I would like to continue, just, uh, it's a um, heavy slide, you can just go through the quote here, but this is taken from an article on, uh, about uh, uh, reflexive control. You heard my quote about how magic is done, and read just the principles of military deception, uh, or specifically Soviet uh, reflexive control, and I think it, 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 it rings a bell in many many similar ways. Uh, if I would continue and uh, uh, spin this story of information warfare uh, through different concepts and through different historical periods, again, those guys who did this uh, uh, explanation of how Soviets played a deception game on, on the West, uh, should be popular, and I think are popular nowadays. The Bismenov, the, uh, uh, the Mitrokhin, uh, who specifically spoke about using networks to have, uh, you know, influences and then social networks. You know, Chepachepa, who, who uh, discussed this in, in the books, and uh, uh, Bismenov had uh, multiple interviews done, they are now uh, available uh, in, uh, on YouTube as well, and everyone gets all surprised. He, he's, he said those things years ago. But I think that is not just a surprise issue from, you know, academic perspective, or analytical perspective. I think it's really, it's really in there. If you would follow the contemporary 
uh, Russian uh, information warfare writers and thinkers, they are really, um, uh, the history rhymes here and they are repeating the stuff that was done in Soviet times and was discussed in, in Soviet military concepts in contemporary uh, annuals of, of uh, information operations or psychological operations. And, and this, this is really interesting to follow how they are academically in this, then you see that then they are as well into uh, discussing Syria operations on, for, for the public uh, debates and then so on and so on. Now, from my perspective, I want to, to um, stick on the message here that uh, uh, Kremlin really approaches this strategy in the, in the military probably um, uh, way or, or military perspective a bit is just to show you the false flag operations or false flag media ops in Europe that are going on for <coughs> decade and more. Here you see uh, the Russian channel, Pervy Baltiski, uh, specifically for the Baltic region, but the, the flag cries out for you, the jurisdiction and the, the, the home country is Latvia. So here you have, uh, uh, for decades, uh, uh, Russian medias being offshored, quite popular now term in the uh, you know, all the pa pa Panama Papers uh, discussions, but it's a media offshoring strategy where you have those uh, channels going into Western media environment and markets and, and using and abusing them for, for their benefits, in, in essence. Here you have a British, oh sorry, Russian uh, channels in Britain. Uh, it's uh, um, multiple of channels that are registered, it's under the Baltic Media Online Alliance umbrella, but they are registered in, in, in London. The, when, I, 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 when I speak about the strategy of media offshoring, I just want to show you this, this should, should be rechecked, I, uh, that's my uh, remark here, because I, I did this uh, already probably months, uh, months ago, uh, just checked it, where the channels in London are registered. Uh, all five channels under one uh, employee, and uh, uh, as well, you know, with a multiple of companies under the same address. So the idea is actually to be under, of course, of comms regula regulation for years, to be able to, to, to of course, have all the uh, freedoms of uh, European media market and so on, and then go forward uh, uh, with the narratives and distraction strategies when, when you need them and when things get tough going. Uh, it's not yet over, that's Russia uh, uh, which was uh, banned multiple times in, in, in Lithuania. Uh, now it's, uh, it is put under the paid package, so you cannot uh, receive it in Lithuanian cable providers free of charge anymore, but they are in Sweden. And therefore you have the uh, false flag of offshoring uh, um, strategy going on for years. It was not just through time of Ukraine that they established those comp companies to do this. Uh, yeah, uh, so we have a kind of a approach of how you enter the market to, to produce distraction stories. I will run quickly through this. It is last year's uh, uh, public opinion survey of this, uh, just uh, to, to have you a feel of this uh, distraction uh, when audiences get into those media environments and, and, and so on. This is the, the, the issue of um, uh, watching Russian channels and uh, it is uh, breaking by, by ethnicity. So, for example, in Lithuanian's case, you see that they, it's almost 75% say that they are l less often or never in, in uh, Russian channels when, when they are asked whether they watched it or not. And we have a different situation, totally different situation, with Russian and Polish mi minority in Lithuania. But if we m move forward, the interesting questions are, what are the value, what, what, what's the distraction there in those... Uh, TV channels, 
And here you see that it's a question of uh, satisfaction or, not, or dissatisfaction with democracy or situation. Suddenly, when this march becomes too difficult for parts of the audience, they, they are distracted by other pictures, you know, of, of, of other illusions or allusions sometimes. Uh, nostalgia for Soviet times as well, and its uh, correlation with the uh, Russian TV channel watching. Uh, I, I'm moving forward because of time a bit. Uh, uh, there is an issue as well that those who are watching are, uh, uh, Russian channels and are uh, declaring the nostalgia for Soviet times. They are very in disagreement of, about doing something with Russian channels. They disagree about uh, restricting the, the, the tra transmissions and, and so on and so on. Uh, and the, the final here slide is of course the, the Russian policy in Ukraine. And, and Russian TV, TV watching, and if, if, if you are in disagreement, you, you probably could guess that they never watched it, but if you are in agreement with Russian policies, you have a, a kind of a correlation as well. Uh, now, just to, to, to wrap this up, the question would be what to do in, in this uh, situation, because it's, it's, a, it's a really important and uh, strategic question. My illustration for those who are discussing uh, freedom of speech and uh, um, the, the problems we face with uh, Russian state TV channels is just to, to, to have an illustration of uh, uh, psychologist Salaport's uh, scale of, of uh, hate speech, which is a kind of a uh, issue if, if you would watch, uh, you know, later the, the, the events unfolding in, in uh, uh, Ukraine's east and, and so on, when from, from this bombardment of, of, of uh, negative images suddenly physical action happens. And in this way, uh, I'm just going through this, uh, maybe I will leave it a bit for discussion as well. My argument here is that we have all tools available to, to, to tackle such a problem. That, that, th those are the points from um, audiovisual media directive, services directive, that, yeah, you can just follow what you have to do when you find out that there's Russian channel in Sweden, in Ofcom, and, and so on, and what you have to, 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 whom you have to approach, what you have to do as a, a, a regulator authority, but in the end, it is possible. It was more difficult before Crimea because nobody understood what is the problem with us when you approach Ofcom with this or you approach Sweden with this. But suddenly, as in many cases, Putin helps a lot and Putin helps uh, to realize the problems of, 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 of such uh, aggressive TV programming as well. And in the end, the answer is quite simple. Hate speech is in this uh, um, um, uh, directive, and you can tackle it if, if it's really uh, about hate speech on na nationality, but the same way about uh, sexual orientation, religion, and then so on. Uh, I'm not getting into the examples of this. Uh, we can maybe I can use them. <laughs> I can use them uh, during uh, our discussion and Q and A. But um, this is how it looks like when uh, Lithuania uh, makes a temporary ban and how that picture looks in a TV screen uh, <laughs> for, for those uh, Russian channels. Uh, my, my final slide here, and I'm done, is just, uh, again, maybe to, 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 to make you think about approaches towards this contra-strategy. Uh, my first point here, we could think about information security the same way we did about energy security. The same way we discussed this out and we had our common approaches towards it. Energy security now is a common knowledge here and then everybody knows that it's about diversification, alternative sources, challenging monopolies, eliminating intermediaries who play a dirty game, political games later, and I'm speaking about energy security issues. It's, it's the same way you can approach this into information security realm. With a, with a way you can tackle uh, all the propaganda manipulations, 
Well, it's, it's, it's the way Ukrainians do and did that under wartime situation. Stop fake is something they did ad hoc because they realized that they need to find it publicly with actualization, with showing how fakes are created and so on. But we have a flexibility to do that not under wartime conditions. And I'm, I'm really thinking that we should do more in European East, East Stratcom as well. Uh, com communication competences, Latvian uh, Strategic Communication Excellency Center, all the media literacy programs that should be in our uh, <coughs> schools and, and, and uh, could be discussed out with young children and, and so on. And my final point here is a, is a word uh, play with intelligence. Intelligence is, could be military intelligence, right, or intelligence, or intelligence could be cultural intelligence or, or realization of uh, how things are done, how communication happens, how manipulation is created. I, I, I'm suggesting thinking maybe we could uh, have a collaboration between excellency centers. For example, excellency center in Latvia is dealing with strategic communication and excellency center in Poland is dealing with uh, uh, counterintelligence issues. So maybe we could just make it uh, collaborate in the way of publicly speaking about risks and threats. And, uh, and, uh, thank you, Narius. You made it very easy for me to build up my story on yours, and this is developing into a sort of storytelling panel of the of today's conference. So I will. Uh, I'm not an academic, so I will tell stories too um, about how media can deal with the situation described so eloquently by previous speakers. And uh, the first one, yeah. let's start from the basics, sauerkraut and pickles. Uh, this is a central market in Riga, many of you have been here, who haven't, uh, you really make it, have to make it your destination next time you are in Latvia. It's a wonderful place, very busy, uh, colorful, and uh, many vegans, not just vegans, uh, buy their staples there because it's fresh, because it's fun, and beautiful architecture, but from anything else too. So, um, why did I choose this, uh, this particular slide showing the Vega Central Market? Because on the 14th of April, uh, which is a midweek, uh, kind of busy, kind of busy day would be normally for people selling sauerkraut and pickles in the central market. But um, a friend of mine overheard a conversation uh, between two ladies selling uh, pickles, saying, "Oh, this is going to be a really, really slow business day." And why? Because Vladimir Putin had a te televised address that day, and the customers would be watching that. And uh, so instead of going to Central Market and buying pickles, they'll be listening to uh, Vladimir Putin answering televised audiences' questions about what he eats for breakfast, and he advised everybody to eat porridge. Um, here, uh, I somehow managed to lose the data labels, but. <laughs> Uh, this, is, this is our reality. This is where all these Swedish and British channels uh, reside. The biggest slice, uh, the, the yellow slice, is not the one that is threatening. It contains dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, niche channels, including, uh, for example, Fox News, that I'm sure will, will grow uh, in terms of audience share and maybe will merit a special slice of its own once it starts showing the new season of Game of Thrones. But uh, the one that we are concerned about is the blue one, uh, which has uh, three main Russian channels, which is, uh, which is a third of the main kind of slices. It, it's bigger than uh, the commercial channels combined of MTG Group, Modern Times Group, and uh, bigger than public service media. But this is even more interesting. Uh, when you look at the uh, audience, uh, Latvian audience and Russian audience, and sorry for using Russian, this is a shortcut. This is people who speak Russian at home, which doesn't necessarily mean uh, ethnic Russian. But this is just for the shortcut purposes, let's call them Russian audience. You will see that where they get 
their news. The top three channels in these two audiences don't overlap. So people watch complete, live in completely separate worlds whilst inhabiting the same very small uh, country with very small media market. But, so what they get from these, uh, uh, where they get their news is uh, very different. And there was also um, opinion poll that showed that in particular, uh, the events in the world and in uh, Russia dominate that news menu. This is where the, the Russian-speaking audience, you know, they watch NTV Mir or RTR or uh, Pierre Baltiski, and this is the picture of the world that they are getting. Um, getting back to what Artis Pabriks mentioned in his uh, excellent uh, keynote, there was a lack of investment into uh, Russian language public service content. There was no political uh, will to do that. Uh, there were ideas, including the one in, in Latvia just last year, to, to build a new channel. And uh, that was uh, successfully killed by our government. So there's still no channel in Latvia, but there is something happening. There are some formats in the Russian language on the public television. And there is a full-fledged channel uh, in uh, Estonia. And uh, in the following uh, few minutes that I have, I will uh, look onto some journalistic tools that using these channels that work in the language that the audience, to, the, to your right, uh, prefers to consume its media uh, from uh, what can be done, what are the tools at our disposal, how to talk to that audience and uh, maybe diversify that picture a little. So when, they, when, when uh, the Russian-speaking audience uh, watches those three channels, you know, the one from Tottenham Road and uh, Sweden and one Pyro Baltiski. What they learn, of course, is that uh, all Ukrainians are uh, fascists and, and fans of uh, Stefan Bandera, that all Norwegians are pedophiles. And uh, this, I'm sorry, it will excuse me for this immodesty, but I really love this. So according to several Russian channels, the Baltic Center for Media Excellence, uh, that I'm head of uh, has uh, it, it's a center of anti-Russian propaganda. This is Ren TV, another channel called as the headquarters of anti-Russian propaganda. <laughs> given given that we have two employees, I'm very honored. But uh, <laughs> also, uh, according to the Russian channels, our budget is 2.5 million. And uh, my assistants and I, since this uh, has been on air, have been searching high and low, <laughs> look behind the printer. And, uh, <laughs> so if anyone knows where those 2.5 million, please tell me, because I could really do with that money. So uh, there's one thing that is very much true, we are, we are friends with Medusa. So what can we do? Um, we can tell stories, compelling stories, that is something that we as journalists can do. And uh, the way we do it is uh, what has been missing from airwaves in uh, both Estonia and Latvia, countries where the situation in this respect with the Russian language audiences is the most dire. They have been underserved continuously for many years. So what we can do is telling stories that are uh, of a different perspective and that also bring uh, people to the screen that had not been there before. They, are, uh, they have to have uh, local relevance, it has to be uh, good storytelling, and I will depart from uh, my, my presentation for just a second to show you, I'm sure you didn't come here to watch TV, but uh, just for a few seconds, this is one of the ways how you can do it. This is a story, uh, featuring a very famous chef in Latvia. He's uh, Latvian, but he speaks Russian in this program. And he travels to different countries uh, searching for the best recipes of iconic foodstuffs from these countries. And uh, this was uh, a, an experimental uh, kind of, uh, story uh, to show on the second channel of Latvian TV 
but it had uh, very high ratings and, uh, and uh, many uh, good feedback from, uh, from the audience. And it was about Ukraine. So Martin Schirmer went to Ukraine in search of the best recipes for borscht, and he, uh, he found uh, four different types of borscht from different uh, parts of Ukraine. So uh, there is no politics here. No, he doesn't talk about uh, the conflict. He doesn't talk. Of, he doesn't talk about Crimea, but he does tell stories uh, about real people and shows Ukraine from the perspective that, of course, it would never appear in the uh, Russian channels. So he found uh, four different recipes and uh, tried to replicate them. So enough, enough of moving pictures. Let's go back to the slideshow. Uh, just to illustrate that it works, in 2014, when five new Russian language uh, formats were launched on Latvian television in uh, September of 2014, uh, one of the programs that was featured there uh, called Lichna uh, Diela had started from zero and grew to audience reach of 350,000 people in the space of four months. At the end of 2015, the audience reach is half a million, which is a serious uh, figure for, for a country the size of Latvia. Another powerful tool at the disposal of uh, Russian uh, language media is a local relevance, something again that was not available before. And this is an example from Estonia that in 2014, uh, when uh, Estonian president, uh, to whom we are now royally married, is like, uh, <laughs> uh, so in 2014, the 31st of December, New Year's address by, by Ilvas, this is how, uh, uh, this was the audience share among non-Estonians that that address reached. Uh, a year later, it was shown on ETV+, Plus, the Russian language channel, at the same time as on ERR, and see how the audience grew. Um, local relevance, of course, this is another uh, graph just to show that once you introduce something that had been missing from the media space, of course, you cannot possibly reach the size of all those uh, massive uh, behemoth uh, channels that, that, uh, that are re retransmitted from Russia. Of course, you can't compete in terms of the funding available, the, the funding for one Sunday night show on the main Russian channel is probably the same as funding for the entire year for all five Russian language formats on LTV. But you can do things with uh, storytelling and local relevance and something that grounds audience to where they live. And this is just another example, courtesy of my colleague from, from Tallinn, Andres Yosa, who, who showed me that the uh, audience reach of the whole public uh, broadcaster that was outside of, largely outside of Russian audiences' uh, you know, view uh, has grown since introducing the, the Russian channel. ETV Plus. Yeah, thank you. Um, another uh, tool that uh, we as uh, journalists can use, uh, and that uh, ties to what Nerius was uh, mentioning in, in his last slide on uh, media literacy, we can, we as journalists can deconstruct the myths that are produced by the Russian channels. And we do have, I disagree with Artis Public so that we do have good journalism in Latvia and good investigative journalists in particular from Red Baltica Investigative Journalism Center who are doing that uh, on a daily basis. And this is just one of those, remember that uh, I showed a picture from the all Norwegians are pedophiles story that, that was very popular with Russian channels, uh, television and online. And uh, they showed how myths are born. So the, the way these stories uh, break, they usually appear 
somewhere on the, on some blog or on the web, and then a television channel would uh, would uh, quote it as a source, and then it uh, spreads. And then uh, some useful idiots, uh, sorry, um, uh, people uh, with uh, uh, some name, you know, public figures uh, would uncritically consume that information and present it as truth. So it started from, it was generated by the Russian channels, and then a very prominent uh, Latvian uh, children's doctor said, oh, you know, and then they, they, they teach, uh, they say that incest in, in families is a normal thing. This is what Norwegians teach at schools. And then, and then it kind of reproduced uh, uh, further. And so one of the ways to deal with that is to deconstruct the myths and, and show how it's done. Uh, and this is my last slide. This is my uh, one minute of advertising is uh, what we do as a Baltic Center for, for Media Excellence. One is we work on media literacy project, but another thing is that we, we bring people who shake up uh, a little of our thinking of how we are working because of course, it's not just a question about the Russian audiences and the media working in the Russian language. It also applies to Estonian media, Lithuanian and Latvian, how we tell our stories so we, so we don't become the multipliers, uh, uncritical multipliers of these misleading messages, and so we don't continue telling you know, that Ukrainians and uh, fascists and Norwegians are... Oh. I think my, my message really is really short, which is just listen to these guys. What's so interesting for me is the depth of expertise and the sharpness of analysis you get from people in the Baltic states. If you ask their counterparts in this country to talk about the way in which <coughs> Russian propaganda is getting into the minds of the British public, we couldn't do that because the research doesn't exist. And that's really my, my sort of fundamental point. The Baltic states are right on this because they have got this, to use an Americanism, from the get-go. I was in Lithuania in 1990, and I remember when um, the, the January the 13th, actually 1991, the January 13th events happened, and watching Nevzorov, the Russian, very famous Russian TV journalist, um, who we rather admired in those days because he had done, he'd launched a program called 600 Seconds, which is very sharp by Soviet standards, astonishingly sort of westernized and interesting um, investigative television program. And suddenly he was turning up, um, making out that uh, the Lithuanians were fascists and that Russians were in danger. And he suddenly felt the whole weight of the Soviet propaganda machine turned on us in Lithuania in a way which we hadn't really felt before. We hadn't had kind of full-blown attack. So I think that it really from that moment on, people in the Baltics woke up <coughs> to the way in which propaganda could be used against them, even in a su supposedly um, democratic and pluralistic um, society, which the Soviet Union was pretending to be towards the end. <coughs> and that knowledge has been, ever since, it's become sharper over time, um, the way in which Pierre Batisti Canal, even in the early 90s, was being used as a means for um, Russian propaganda, influencing decision-making, ripping up people, very crude and unsophisticated and not very systematic by the, today's standards. Um, but you in the Baltic states have been frontline states from the very beginning in a way that many people in other countries simply didn't understand and to some extent don't understand. It is beginning to change now. We see NATO is beginning to take this seriously. The EU is beginning to take this seriously. For those of you who don't get it, I really strongly recommend the um, weekly disinformation bulletin, which is put out by the European External Action Service. Um, it's, it's amazing what you can do with no budget and with no political support. This is basically one very sharp Czech diplomat um, who um, goes through the disinformation for the week and makes a very good systematic breakdown, a guy called Jakub Kalensky. And he sent it out. Very amusing, the first time he did it, his bosses came to him and said, this is very interesting, but do we really need to put this on the internet? <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, the whole idea is actually we're trying to warn people about this. They said, OK, well, keep going, but remember, you can't spend any money. And he literally has no money. If he wants to come to London, someone here in London has to invite him because he has zero travel budget. But with very limited resources and with very ambiguous political backing, we are beginning 
um, to get our, our act together. Um, but there's still a lot of misapprehensions. I was particularly struck by um, Mr. Steinmeier, who is not perhaps my favourite German politician, although there are worse, worse models are also available. But Steinmeier was, Mr. Steinmeier was in Estonia the other day, and he said, we are in, in, in Germany, are worried about German, uh, about Russian disinformation efforts um, in Western Europe. And we're going to send you some of our best experts to Estonia to teach you how to deal with it. <laughs> and of course, it's completely the other way around. What you want is Estonian and Latvian and Lithuanian and Ukrainian experts to go to the Germans and say, hello, this is what's going on. It's not just the Lisa case, which was very, very conspicuous and really woke the Germans up. It's happening all the time, all over your channels in all sorts of different ways. And so I think this is one of my really big messages. We in the so-called West, the Old West, have got to understand that the expertise is there in the East. Maybe we have more money if you want foundations and you know, sources of funding. That may be in the West. You, know, you can get audiences in the West. But the real concentration of expertise is in Tallinn, Riga, Vilnius, Kiev, Warsaw, Prague, and other places. And as friends of the frontline states, our biggest job is to try and get that expertise over here and get it in front of editorial decision makers and political decision makers. Now, you very kindly mentioned my think tank, um, SEPA. Um, those of you who speak Polish will know why I call it SEPA in Polish. Um, that's meant to be a joke. There must be no Polish speakers here. SEPA <laughs> um, in Polish is a very rude word, so we have to call it SEPA. When we, when we formed the acronym, there wasn't anyone from Poland around. So, um, we, um, but we, are, we now have a team of monitors um, in the frontline states yeah, but there's one Polish speaking here, and she's whispering. <laughs> her, friend. her friend is laughing, so that proves it was a joke. <laughs> um, the, um, but we have a team of media monitors now in the frontline states who every week go through both the vernacular media and the local Russian language lead, me, media and stuff in Russia about that country and put it together and do a report, which we then can synthesize and draw conclusions for. We are working on a big um, report for American policymakers, uh, which we're going to have done by the summer, I hope, which mirrors the already excellent report done by the European Endowment for Democracy, um, which was um, presented to European decision makers. Now, you may say, well, why haven't I seen this? And the answer is, it's very interesting catch here. The stuff we, pump, we, we pull together, we can't actually publish, because if we did publish, it would be libelous. And I, having fought, spent a year of my life fighting against an extremely rich and powerful Russian who sued the economists for libel, I have no desire to repeat that. But, for example, one of the things we've, we've looked at is the way in which um, Russia used information warfare to affect decision-making in a Baltic country, which I won't name because I don't want to be sued, about an energy <laughs> project, which I also don't want to name. And it's very interesting, you can absolutely see that they were targeting the decision makers, they were targeting public opinion, trying to whip up um, public opinion against this particular um, energy project, and were pretty successful. They derailed it. But to put that in terms that make sense, you have to mention the word Lithuania and the word nuclear. Oh dear, I've done it now, I'm sued. Um, and so we can't publish that in the way we'd like, we, we'd like, we'd like to publish it, because it would immediately attract the attention of, of, of the library lawyers. Um, so it's quite a paradox, really. You take what's fundamentally open source information, put it together and draw your conclusions and you're immediately um, worried about, um, about English libel law. But there we are, these things happen. Um, so that's a little bit about, uh, about, about what CEPA what C C C is doing. Um, but there's a great deal more to do. And one of the things I was really struck by was the excellence of the statistics we just saw about reach and impact. And you can do that in the Baltic States because you have quite large numbers of people who tune into this stuff, and you're constantly monitoring your public opinion about what they think about democracy in Russia and so on. But we just don't have that in the West. We don't have a daily transcript of what's on RT. It's really interesting this. I've asked intelligence agencies and governments, and they all say, that's a really great idea. If you do that, can you um, put us on the, on the subscription list? But if you want to know what did RT say about Crimea in 2012, that would be really interesting to know. Did they ever broadcast anything about it? If you want to know, how is, is RT, um, yeah, RT is first of all saying that um, everyone in Europe is very racist and anti-migrant, but on the other hand, they're also saying, watch out, the migrants are coming and going to kill you. So let's try and 
work out how they balance those two messages and do they do one in their news programs and one in the opinion programs or how does, how does that work? Well, good luck with Google because that's the only tool you've got. Just occasionally you'll find some academic who has followed a particular strand of disinformation and has transcribed lots of RT and then that's really useful. You can say, oh, that's so interesting, but this is how the RT line on, I don't know, the Balkans or policing in America has evolved over time. But we don't have this fundamental basic tool, which is transcripts. Now, when I was working at the BBC in the 1980s, um, covering the Eastern Bloc countries, every morning on my desk, I got a watch of paper for monitoring. We have some people here, veterans of Caversham, and I take my hat off to you because that was really, really useful. It was basically everything the Soviet Union had said the day before. And you could get raw monitoring, which was like that, or process monitoring, that was like that. But it was a really useful analytical tool. And it was all filed, and you'd go back and look at it and draw conclusions. And we, we don't do that now. We do a bit of translating of the main Russian news, not nearly as much as I think we should do. But as far as the sort of systematic look at Russian propaganda, it just isn't there. We're, li we're missing this basic tool. And that's not the only thing we're missing. We're also missing the region impact because we don't know how many people in this country watch RT. You can ask Nielsen, I phoned up our audience research people and uh, the, the, the audience research company, and they said, well, we can find out a few, it would cost about you know, 20, 30,000 pounds, but we could, we, could, we, could, we, could, we could have a look. And I said, fine, send the bill to The Economist, I'm not. Um, and, um, but we, we, anecdotally, we know that there are, um, and, and some intelligence agencies in some countries have, done, have, have taken a look at this, and they say, yes, RT is appealing to people who very, already have very strong anti-systemic feelings. People who basically think that 9-11 is a conspiracy theory, that the world is run by Jews and Freemasons or whatever, who are deeply alienated from democracy, um, and RT appeals there. But the numbers aren't big enough to move the needle as far as re regular audience research is concerned. Yeah, it's lot, along with Press TV, Al Jazeera, Deutsche Welle in English, there's all sorts of stuff on the cable. But it, if it doesn't get over the sort of 3 or 4%, it doesn't appear on the public um, main audience research figures. So we don't know, and the result of that is we don't know what we should worry about. You know, well, you, every now and again you get a headline, RT is launching in Germany. Oh my goodness, well that sounds quite bad, Germany's a big country, we know they're quite squishy anyway on these things. Well, that could be quite bad, and you look up on the internet, you see, in fact, it's only a couple of programs at the moment in Germany. But should we be worried about it? We don't know. We don't know how many Germans are tuning into this. We need to do focus groups and find of Germans who are already quite pro-Russian, do they actually watch our team? Maybe it's just a complete waste of money. One of the few bits of research that was done, which is a brilliant piece by the Daily Beast, showed that RT was lying massively about their impact in North America. And they were getting a lot of money from the Russian government on the basis that they were getting, having a big impact in North America. And actually, the methodology um, they were using was, was pretty phony. They didn't have the reach they said. So in a way, I was pleased, because you know, that's, uh, that's better than them ha actually having real reach. But we don't know these things. And we, in, the, in countries outside the Baltic states, have got to somehow get the money and do the work, find out how many people are tuning in, and really get a database of the, um, of the content so that we can start analysing not just what this particular channel is saying, but also how things hop from place to place. Where does um, our ear, is this news that stops, news or disinformation that starts in Russian media, then goes into RT, or is RT making up its own myths? Or maybe RT is making <coughs> up its myths which then go back into the Russian media. Now, occasionally, you can, you, people will do little studies on this, and it's very interesting. You can see how, for example, in Germany, the Lisa myth um, originated and how it moved around and became a kind of fact or fact of it. But this is all totally unsystematic. It's done by people like you and me who are interested in this subject. We do it as a research, and maybe it's journalism, maybe it's academia, maybe it's the government, but it isn't the sort of systematic picture which we had during the Cold War. Um, what can we do? Um, apart from that, and that is really the number one thing, I think, is just to get the, actually get the data. What more can we do to, um, to push back? We need to raise the cost of doing business for the propagandists. It was really interesting seeing um, this data about media ownership, but the way in which um, corporate registries work 
in the West is a bit of a scandal, as we've seen in the Panama Papers. And it's quite difficult to apply um, the, you know, one country's media law to something that is broadcasting over the internet, maybe in your language, but based in another. And that's something I think we need, we need, we need a Europeans, over to the foreign ministers here. We need to work out how you can apply um, European um, media law for broadcasters on, on a Euro or European level. We can go after them for money laundering and we can go after them with sanctions because as Mr. Kisilyov, whose face briefly was shown there, I love Mr. Kisilyov, well, the along with getting the order of the Grand Duke Gediminas fourth class, there is a fifth class, I was very proud of it, and one of the greatest honours of my life um, was being getting a seven minute segment on Mr. Kisilyov's program where he called me the village idiot of British journalism. That was a really big day. <laughs> I, I, I downloaded that and saved it just in case it would disappear off the internet. Um, but yeah, Mr. Kisilov is sanctioned um, as a non, yeah, un, under, under the post Crimea sanctions. So we can, uh, we can go after them with sanctions, we can go after them with media law. We can also go after them with name and shame. And I, I caused a bit of a fuss um, just over a year ago um, by saying in a speech at the Munich Security Conference that anyone who was thinking of working for RT or Sputnik should bear in mind that this is not the beginning of their career in journalism, this is the end of their career in journalism. Because if any crosses my desk at The Economist, which has RT or Sputnik on it, it will go straight in the bin, because we are journalists, not propagandists. So this is like going to work for the tobacco companies as a PR person, only a hundred times worse. So just think about that and tell people, if you're thinking of working, because they, people don't realise, they think this is just a regular job. And quite a few of the defectors we've seen from RT, people like Liz Moore and, 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 and others, who they signed up for it because they thought this was just another TV station. They genuinely didn't really realise what it was they were getting into. So we can make it more difficult for the entire people. Um, we can also um, go after the people who appear there. And there's a, a certain category of um, expert who is so desperate to get onto television that they'll quite happily give interviews to RT. They are, they are not necessarily pro kremlin they're just humble academics, think tankers, authors, and someone phones up and says, I'm from a television station called RT, we would like to interview you about your book. What's not to like? <laughs> Every author is desperate to sell that book. But actually, you can say these to people, you can write to them and say, hang on, why did you do that? I and mean, I usually put it out on Twitter, what is a reputable expert so-and-so? Um, recently, it was Hubertus Hoffman, who runs something called the World, I think World Information Network, or so he's a German very keen to sort of present himself as, a, as, as an international sort of authority. And he was on RT, so I started calling him out on Twitter and saying, hello, at, Huber, at Hubertus Hoffman, why are you on a Kremlin propaganda channel? And the first few times he said, stop harassing me. And I said, I'll stop harassing you when you stop appearing on a Kremlin propaganda channel. <laughs> and now he doesn't appear there anymore. So we can, we, can, we can all do that. We can make it harder for them to get people to work there. We can make it harder for them to get contributors. So we can raise the cost of doing business with it. And finally, we can, we can push back. Um, and I think it was really interesting seeing that Latvian program about, the, um, about recipes. This sort of stuff's pretty expensive. I used to work at the BBC. Doing high quality broadcast television is expensive. And I don't think we've got the money, even if we put all our money together, to do a rival to something like um, Rossiya, um, or one of the, the big Russian channels. They have budgets in the billions, and we're not going to produce something that is as good as that. Maybe in, in a kind of local media micro like Estonia, yeah, it may be worth doing it as ETV+. Plus. But that's not, it's certainly not going to push back um, into Russia um, with the sort of money we've got at the moment. But there are things we can do. I think we forget about broadcasting, and we go for a pull model, where you put really good, fun, interesting stuff on YouTube, and then get the Russians to share it with each other. Um, so go for a pull model rather than a push model. Um, I think satire offers a lot of scope. Russians have not lost their sense of humour. The anecdote was one of the most powerful weapons we had against the, um, against the Soviet Union. Um, and those of you who of a certain age may remember all those wonderful Radio Yerevan sort of jokes, uh, which exposed the absurdity and pomposity and corruption and hypocrisy of the Soviet Union. Well, there's plenty of absurdity, pomposity, corruption, hypocrisy in Putin's Russia, and we should be doing everything we can to get, um, get satire and comedy 
out there. I personally would, would get Cookley going again. Those of you who remember, mm -hmm. Cookley was the Russian version of spitting images. It was terribly funny. And they made fun of Putin, and suddenly they weren't on air anymore. And the guy, Shenderovich, who ran it, is now living in town. So I would start trying to you know, resurrect these things. Um, I think investigative journalism is great. One minute. Um, the, you mentioned um, Ray Bortica. That's fantastic. Um, we should be doing more of that, particularly, and I'll finish here, investigative journalism that hits corruption in the West. Because then Russians will believe it. I'll stop there. Thanks very much.